Welcome to the Mixtape with Scott. This is Scott Cunningham, uh, professor at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I think we're on the either the 91st or 92nd. I think it, I think this is the 92nd episode, three seasons, 92 interviews. Uh, really fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for coming and uh listening. Those of you that list still still are hanging in there and listening to this thing. Uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. Uh, and I hope it's been a lot of fun for you too. Um, this week's uh, guest is Jesse Rothstein, the Carmel P. Friesen, professor of public policy, professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley. He's very, very well known labor economist. Um, and I won't go into all the superlatives, but you know, he he's kind of that kind of comes from it's kind of been associated with all the the great labor departments, you know. In my mind, uh, the, a lot of the great labor departments like the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, also Princeton. And so it's, uh, but but another thing about talking with Jesse that I was really excited about is he's a David Card student. And as those of you know, uh, not only am I really interested uh, in, you know, I'm very interested in, uh, you know, the causal, the causal inference uh, intellectual social history, but I'm very interested in the students. Um, I'm very interested in how this paradigm shift moved through, uh, economics via the students, not just the, the people, the writer, the people that won this Nobel prize, but, but through the kind of work that the students did and the, and the colleagues. And so it was really fun talking to Jesse, um, you know, as a, that's like a hook, uh, for me into talking with people, but it was really wonderful talking to Jesse. Um, we had never met formally. We'd spoken a few times and I teach his augmented synthetic control paper um, all the time. And it's, I think it's probably one of my favorite papers in that branch of the synth literature and synth literature, not being nearly as uh, I guess, you know, you, well, it's, it actually is, probably getting to be as large as that difference in differences literature. Uh, and um, as both of those, the econometrics of diff and diff and the econometrics of scent continue to evolve, you're starting to see that uh, the use cases for the methods, put aside the econometric of the methods, but the reasons that you would use one of them, it's becoming the case that you could justify it that you could justify the other um, just as well. The world's getting complicated. Uh, the, the econometric, you know, the the causal inference program evaluation is complex. It's complicated. Uh, and so anyway, Je Jesse's written a lot of great papers in labor, education, uh, discrimination, but he's also got these very cool new papers on synthetic control that I really love with uh, Eli Ben Michael and Avi Feller. So, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you like uh, this interview. Um, if you do, uh, tell somebody about it. And um, I'll see you next week. I'm going to turn it over right now to the the other Scott Cunningham and uh, from just a few minutes ago and Dr. Jesse Rothstein. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, it is my pleasure to have with me someone I've, I've I don't think we've, yeah, we talked, we've, we've emailed briefly recently, but we've never, I don't think we've spoken. Uh, Jesse Rothstein. Jesse, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's nice well, to so, see you in person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> for the sake of the listener, uh, could you tell us your, um, uh, your full job title and who pays your salary? Sure. I teach at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where I'm the Carmel P. Friesen Chair in Public Policy and Economics. Oh, okay. And I also I also wear another hat where I'm the Faculty Director of the California Policy Lab at Berkeley. Awesome. Awesome. I can't wait to talk to you about uh, those things. Okay, well, let's start with sure. an icebreaker. Um, what's a vacation that you took uh, ever? I mean, when you were little, it could have been recently. It doesn't have to have been your favorite vacation. It could even have been your worst vacation, but it's something right. that you've thought about uh, a couple of times since then. Interesting. Um, I think a couple of years ago, it must have been 2001, 2021, I took my family to Glacier National Park 
and that oh. was a, that's just a spectacular place i'd been there when i was a uh, like 20 and taking my kids back there was just great oh wow what would your kid how old were your kids they were like i don't know 13 and 11 then yeah what would they think they liked it they liked it you know some of the hikes were a bit much for them and we didn't get into the back country or anything like that but oh. um but one reason i keep thinking about it is because they're gonna have to rename it because all the glaciers are disappearing Oh, really? What are they going to call it now? I don't know, but there's a, it's going to be strange to have a Glacier National Park with no glaciers. Yeah, that's that's going to be a big bummer if you go there and there's nothing, yeah. you can't find any. Well, cool. Yeah. That's, that's those, well, that's great. Well, so, so, so tell me, where did you grow up? I grew up in LA. In oh, okay. Monica. Okay. What did your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad at the time was a union organizer. Uh, oh. My mom did a number of different things, but when I was in high school, she ran a community center that provided a homeless shelter and a battered women's shelter and a number of other oh. kind of community services. So you kind of come from a background of people that are, uh, you, well, your dad being in working for unions and labor was a big part of your, it's like in your DNA. Yeah. A little bit. yeah I mean, you know, my parents were part of the 60s new left um mm. i think they you know they my mom went to jail in mississippi for registering black voters oh wow. and that was that kind of idea that you have a, your job is to make the country a better place was kind of part of part of my growing up wow 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 that's that's got to be pretty formative um did you have any siblings i do i have a younger sister oh okay so 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 what kind of games were you, what kind of games did you like to play when you were like maybe a little kid? Yeah. Uh, so I know in high school, I got into board games with a good friend of mine, a bunch of Axis and Allies and uh, I forget what all the other ones were called. Uh, there were various, various kind of complicated board games that now my kids are into and they're way too complicated for me now. But it, yeah. uh, when I was 14, I loved them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are great because they're great. They're so social and they're so, yeah. they require so much thinking too, but they're so great just exactly. being all around the table. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So in the, in the, when you're in high school and there's not that many things you can do, it's a way to hang out with your friends all day. And right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Those games also take a long time. So it's a lot of fun just hanging out. It, yeah. Well, so when did, when you were, you know, around those ages, like early, middle school, uh, you know, mm -hmm. did you ever have thoughts like, you know, this is what I want to be when I grow up? I didn't really worry too much about what I wanted to be when I was at that age. Um, mm. I figured, I guess I figured it would work itself out. And I didn't really, I didn't know. And I didn't have, there wasn't something I was dying to do. Mm. And I figured it would take care of itself. Um, mm. You know, I was always good at math. And I went on to be a math major and I knew enough about the world to work to know that that would probably put me in a pretty good place, mm. even if I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Was the math options at your high school pretty good? I think they were normal. You know, it was, you know, it was a good school. And so I could take calculus, mm. but there wasn't anything unusual, I think, about it. Yeah. Yeah. What would your teachers, if I could have eavesdropped in the teacher's lounge, you know, what do you think I would have heard them saying about you? Ah, uh, so I had one teacher who complained that I corrected her too much um, <laughs> <laughs> in elementary school. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I think they thought I was engaged and bright, mm. but I don't know that any of them would have predicted I'd become an economist. I certainly mm. wouldn't have. Yeah. Had you heard of that kind of thing? In high school, I'd heard of it, but it wasn't. I hadn't. I didn't know much about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, I knew growing up, I was always interested in policy and politics. Ah. And I knew I liked to do math, and it took me a while to understand that this was a way to combine those two. Mm. It, you mean like so? From early on, you would it, it felt a little bit like that would have been picking between things, and so you picked math. Yeah, I mean, not thinking I was going to become a mathematician or that I was going to do that forever, but I liked doing it, and it was a it was something to study in college. Um, and for I, one of the reasons I majored in math was a sense that it required fewer courses than a lot of the other majors. 
Oh, really? And so I had already done done a good chunk of them by the end of the sophomore year. Um, and so I was really done with my major midway through junior year. Oh. And that meant I could take all kinds of things. Yeah. And so I took history and I took literature and philosophy. Oh. Oh, did you take any economics? I took one economics class in college and hated it. Was it that EC10 class? Yep. You yeah, hated it, was, it. Wow. Was that I Marty? Hated it. Who taught it? It was Marty Feldstein. Um, I I was, you know, I was, uh, I, I thought of myself, I was fairly progressive mm. uh, politically um, and saw economics in the, in the 90s was kind of still at the ascendance of, of Chicago school style economics. Mm. The, um, the first lecture, Marty gave a lecture about how it was really important to distinguish between positive and normative analyses. Mm -hmm. And this class was going to be entirely about positive analyses and it wasn't going to make any, any value judgments. And that's, that was key to economics. And then every other lecture of the semester, he trampled all over that distinction. <laughs> like what's an example that you really, really <laughs> stunned you? Talking about, you know, the importance of low taxes, how we uh, need to lower tax rates or we need to lower corporate taxes or free trade you know, mm. any of these, you can talk about, about, about benefits, you can talk about costs. And then, you know, if you're, if you're really just positive, then you leave it to somebody else to decide whether the costs outweigh the benefits, but that wasn't how that class worked. Right. right. It didn't help that, that the um, class was taught mostly by the TAs. Mm. That's the way, it was, the way it was set up then. And my TA was a Harvard business school student who wore a Harvard tie every day. Mm. not and it was very you know it was it was it just felt this wasn't what i was interested in doing mm. wow so then so then you 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 take all these math courses and you really thrive what so if i could have like you know uh eavesdropped on the math faculty lounge mm -hmm. or whatever their teacher lounge is what are they saying about the young jesse rothstein like towards that you know, towards the end I don't think I even knew who I was. Um, you know, uh, I, I I went through college and didn't really stick my head up. I was I enjoyed it and I got I had good friends and I learned a lot, mm -hmm. but I didn't really get to know any of my professors. Mm. Um, so you know, I wrote a senior thesis. So I guess my thesis advisor on a good day would have remembered who I was, but that was about it. You didn't think about going to grad school and becoming a mathematician? No, I it was. I was good at math, but I wasn't that good at math. And uh -huh. it was pretty clear, um, you know, freshman year that I wasn't good enough to to do that. Mm. Um, mm. And it was never something I aspired to. I wasn't hurt by that. But. Right, right. So towards the end of your time at Harvard, uh, is there some sort of future that you're sort of like zeroing in on? No, um, I had still no idea. Uh, I remember feeling like for one like there were certain kinds of jobs that recruited on college campuses um and at the time a lot of that was management consulting mm -hmm. but some wall street kinds of things and i knew i didn't want to do any of those yeah and so i had this resolve that i wasn't going to really even seriously try to look until i graduated mm -hmm. for a job but i remember feeling like that was scary because all my friends knew what they were doing and i had no idea mm -hmm. um I applied to do Teach for America and didn't get it. And mm. They were right not to not to take me. How come? Because um, I hadn't done any teaching. Oh, it wasn't. You know, I was. I'd done some tutoring, but I wasn't. You know, there's no. I I don't. I think it was reasonable to conclude that, that I wasn't the right person for them. Yeah, yeah. It was in the early stages of Teach for America where they were pretty pretty choosy. I see. I see. So what kind of stuff um, are you looking for? You're looking for, so how would you describe the, 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 the reasons you're looking at something like teach for America? What is What's going on? I mean, I'm wanting to do something to see, to explore the world a little bit and also to, to get, to be helpful. Mm. And I thought of, you know, I could explore teaching. I could, I could contribute in some small way and, mm grow up a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah uh but you know so the other things i applied for were all like going abroad 
teaching somewhere. Or, oh. you know, I, but, and that's what I ended up doing. I taught English in Japan after college. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. I thought I saw. You yeah. My, that. my CV doesn't have all of the stuff I did bouncing around after oh, college. Okay. So you were teaching English as a second language in Japan. Exactly. Yeah. How long did you do that for? Less than a year. Um, it was, it was, a one of the, it was a, it, in the days before the Japanese bubble popped, they, they had a lot of money and there were a lot of people who wanted to learn English as a kind of a vanity project mm. and they would hire anybody who'd come do it. Um, if you came from the U S you had to have a college degree because that's what it, what it took to get a visa. Oh. But there were other people who were doing it from Australia or New Zealand without that. Wow. Um, and so I was, I was teaching for this company that was mostly entertainment, not really teaching. What do you mean? Um, so people would sign up for these lessons and they'd come occasionally. And a lot of the appeal was in a period when Japan was pretty closed, they would get to kind of sit and talk with a foreigner for, for an hour. Mm. And that seemed to be why they did it. If you were really oh, serious about learning the language, there were probably more serious uh, options for that. Yeah. So what did that experience do to you, you think? I mean, I... I would say mostly what I got out of it was just living in Japan and, and being in a foreign country. Mm. Uh, when I got off the plane there, I had never eaten sushi. I didn't know a word of Japanese. Um, I learned a little bit of Japanese and I learned to like sushi, but, um, but it was an experience living in a place where you really couldn't speak the language and kind of navigating your way around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I, it was not always comfortable, but I, I got a lot out of it. Yeah. So you leave, is it always just going to be a one-year gig or is it like you left prematurely? It could have been longer, but I did, I had never, there was no promise to go for longer than I, mm -hmm. than I did. Yeah. So I went and checked it out and did it for a while. And there were some people who kind of became lifers, but that wasn't, that wasn't ever on my, on my plan. And, but well, I the, the thing I saw is this yeah. economic policy Institute gig as a researcher. What was that? That's yeah. after that experience? That's after there were there was something else in between, but yeah, that was after. Oh, what did you do um, before that? So I came back in what was it? it would have been kind of late spring, nineteen ninety six, and I thought, you know, well, there's these campaigns going. Why don't I go work on a political campaign? Oh, okay. Um, and so I went to I went to the some trainings for political for potential campaign staffers. Um, they, I got slotted into something that they called voter file manager, which was basically managing a database at a time when the mm. technology made that a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting a job in New Jersey as, uh, helping to manage the database for the, but, for the, for campaigns. And, and was that like your first time to be working with data? Um, in high school, I had had a job working at a, at a local nonprofit kind of hand entering the receipts from their in-kind donations. Uh -huh. So I, I kind of built a database, but it wasn't any, any real, it was really just data entry. So this was the first, this was kind of getting a little bit more involved in it. Mm, what do you think? How did it feel doing all that stuff? It was, it was interesting. I mean, the, the technology was just, it's hard to imagine today. Um, if we actually, the, the idea was that the campaigns might want to get a list of voters who met some characteristics so that they could go kind of walk to their houses or send them a mailing. And there was a company that the Democratic National Committee had contracted to build these databases for these voter files for all the, for all the states. Mm -hmm. um, and my job was to interface between the campaigns and that company. Uh, and, but the company had all the voter files on these giant magnetic tapes so to even do a query would take several days Oh, to just, and so the campaigns would say, well, look, we have a budget of this amount. We want to kind of get a list of voters who meet these criteria. And but we don't know if we can meet that budget. And it was, it was basically a, a week long process to get an answer from the company about how much that would even cost, let alone to generate the list. Hmm. Um, and so I did a little bit of estimating what the, what it would cost, but a lot of, being the kind of point of contact for campaigns that were angry that they weren't getting what they needed out of the, out of the mm. database. What was the cost? It was labor. Uh, call, the, the cost to get the list. Yeah. I actually don't know what, what, where the contractor was getting the cost. I mean, it would have been labor. I assume they were covering the fixed cost of the computing, which was, mm. mm -hmm. you know, this isn't just buying a laptop in those days. They had a All giant right. 
room with these, you know, magnetic tapes as big as I was. Right. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So, well then, then you end up, so what, so you, you don't, you don't kind of are not, you, you're not moving in the direction. It sounds like of like, what, like staying on, you know, working on campaigns or something like that. Was that what you were thinking you might do? I, again, I wasn't really thinking about what a career would be at that point. Um, mm. I, I guess I could have, I thought I might continue and do more campaigns some, but then I saw the people who'd become lifers and that was a tough life. Mm. Um, you know, on these campaigns, when they get going, you're working hundred hour weeks, uh, and you're moving to wherever they need you for three months and then moving on. Um, that wasn't something I wanted to, I could see myself doing in the long term. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, I did it for a while and then that was, and you know, this, I wouldn't say it was a totally successful experience given all the troubles with the voter file. So it wasn't clear that there was a niche for me mm. there. Um, and then eventually, you know, uh, my dad knows people who, who are at this economic policy Institute. He puts me in touch with them. They hear math major who's interested, who's worked on campaigns and is interested in policy and think that's actually a good fit for what they do. Mm. Um, and so I ended up getting a job where half of my job was running their computers and half of my job was was being a research assistant. Oh, so what was that like? It was interesting. I, I learned a lot. Um, you know, it was kind of my first exposure to how you could do kind of economic policy that wasn't wasn't just theory mm. and wasn't was, was to me felt felt less ideological. Um what do you mean? Time what? well, so this was again this dates it this dates itself but at the time it wasn't totally straightforward to kind of spin up the current population survey and run analyses on it it was a it was an endeavor and the economic policy institute put out a book every two years called the state of work in america where they basically spun the cps and did a bunch of tabulations mm. and it was just getting the facts out and it was you know they were definitely you know they came from a perspective where they were worried about declining wages. They were worried about inequality, but they were, they were the reliable generator of the facts because they, mm. they had the setup to be able to spin the CPS. Mm. And that struck me as really useful. Um, so even though you've got this political philosophy that, you know, cause you said you were progressive, that something yeah. about this is refreshing. Yeah, it is. Huh. It is. And I like that, you know, it, Actually, when I was in Japan, I had read Myth and Measurements. Oh, and I'd also really? like that as a as a kind of hey, there's some this, there's a different kind of economics than than what I had learned in X10. Huh. Huh. So you were well, it's funny. I can tell a story where a person is a progressive uh and goes to act 10 and then does not become someone that and then does not become someone that's more grounded in facts and measurement and getting you know they might just they might go in the direction of uh you know deeper in their own political philosophy but you don't do that yeah i think i was interested in in you know empirics and and mm. in kind of knowing what was true about the world and not just deducing it from theory mm. um and again this was a different era in economics where the empirical revolution hadn't really taken over yet there was still a lot of economics was still theory without without much evidence right right and a lot of the empirical evidence was not very good yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah sure sure so you stay there what a couple of years or one year like a year and a half um and then i decide you know i, I like this i can see a future in dc in, in the policy world um and that's an interesting that's i can see how i could i could have a role doing policy mm -hmm. uh from a kind of wonkish side um but i decide that if i'm going to rise up in it i probably need to go to graduate school Mm. Uh, I need a credential and I need to learn, I need to learn some statistics. I knew, you know, I knew lots of pure math, but I didn't know any statistics. Mm. Uh, I probably literally couldn't have defined a standard deviation at that time. Mm -hmm. um, the, and I needed a little bit of economics. 
And so I decided I was going to go get a master's in public policy as a way of, of building up those skills. Mm, so you, so do you apply broadly or is it one of the, you know, there's something about Berkeley draws you to it? I applied fairly broadly to public policy programs. Um, I applied to my, my mentors at, at EPI really wanted me to get a PhD in economics. I was not sold at all, but I let them talk me into applying to one PhD program. Um, and that was Berkeley? a bunch of MPP programs. No, that was Harvard. Oh. I didn't get in. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, That's right. Marty Feldstein was like, no, he blackballed. He remembered that kid. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but anyway, I applied to MPP programs and decided I wanted to go back to California. And so yeah. Berkeley it was. Yeah. Well, so, you know, what, so your first econ class at, and Harvard's like, you know, kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. What's econ like for you that first year at Berkeley? Yeah. So I get to the public policy program thinking, you know, I'm pretty rusty on my bath. It's been been a few years since college. Oh, you're not doing it I'm simultaneously? Really you're doing it like you're doing one? Not at first. I'm, I'm just an MPP. There's no, no plan oh. for PhD at all. At oh, you point. didn't apply to the econ. You applied just to the no. MPP. Got it. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm worried that I'm too rusty, that I'm going to have to struggle to, to get ready for these classes because I haven't done math in a few years. Yeah. And I walk into the stats class and the professor has read our bios and he looks at me and he says, okay, you don't belong in this class. This is not hmm. made for math majors. Hmm. Um, you know, most people get public policy master's degrees have not had a math background. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. They probably haven't had math since high school. Um, so... Basically, I, I then realized, oh, wow, I've, I've showed up to this program where my whole goal was to learn economics and statistics. And the courses that's offering are not the right, are not ones that I'm going to get a lot out of. Mm. Um, and so I end up going over and looking at the the graduate courses in, in the economics department. This is 98. Um, this is what, 98? Uh, this, yeah, this was 98. Okay. Um. So I sign up for, I um, go go to the professor who teaches grad micro and I say, well, look, I missed the first week of classes, uh, but I'm interested because I can't, can't do this in public policy. And he says, well, we had a placement test that you missed, but we here you can a, take it right now. We, have uh, a, we had a placement test to let you get into, for people who are not in the economics department to get into that class. Uh huh. And he Which class me, was it? Which class was it? It was grad micro. Grad micro. Okay. So he's like, yeah. if you want to take grad micro, you got to pass this like place. Yes. Okay. And he gives it to me and I was not planning to take a test that day. I just walked into his <laughs> office and he said, and I sit down and I work for like four hours on it. What and was I, it? At well, some it point was, I wonder, I don't even remember a lot of, you know, it was just a lot of like constrained optimization stuff that you could do. That I kind of vaguely knew how to do, but it was a little more applied than the kind of math that I had done in college. And I was mm. rusty anyway. Yeah. So, um, and so, you know, I'm not sure I'd ever done a Lagrangian uh, at that point, because um, mm -hmm. in college, you know, it would be a, it would be a concrete problem if it was in finite dimensions. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so anyway, so I sit down, I work for four hours. At some point, I think he, we're probably not supposed to be working this long in this class. <laughs> <laughs> and I go back and I said, well, I did, I did some of them, but not all of them. And he lets me into the class. <laughs> oh, he lets you in. I assume basically if you were serious enough to spend time on it, you were, it was willing to let you do it. It was a hurdle. Um, it, was a, yeah. it was a signal. Got it. Yeah. So I ended up doing that. And then, um, so what's that know, class? Who's teaching that class? It was Steve Goldman and Chris Shannon. Oh, okay. In the okay. first semester. So it was, it was a pretty serious theory class. It was Moscow L. Uh -huh. You know, it was, um, and it was a math class and I could do math classes. And, mm. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of of moralizing about policy. It was just doing doing math. I mean, yeah, I enjoyed it and I did well at it. Yeah, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do for a career, but it wasn't such a hurdle to get through as I had thought it would be. Well, were you hearing any economics or were you hearing math? I mean, what what were you you know you've you've not had you don't have this economics background. So like, what's yeah. what's kind of floating up to the top in that class? I mean, you know, it's it's lots of theorems about the equivalence between revealed preference and utility functions. Mm. Um, mm. You know, and I could work on that. I didn't see it as all that relevant to, you know, should we have free trade with China? 
or right. whatever the policy questions were of the day, but I, it was something I could do. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And so I worked, I mean, went way through it. I signed up for the, the econometrics class. What'd you think when you took that class? I was starting to get interesting. It was still no data. Right. Um, you know, it was a linear yeah. algebra class. Um, and I think we had to do a couple of applied exercises in a language called TSP. Yeah, I remember that. But it was, yeah, um, yep. but it was not anything that was really, there was nothing empirical about it. Mm. But that was the first time I actually saw what a regression was. I've mm. never seen a regression before. Mm. Um, and so I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, and then at some point in that year, I went to talk to David Card. And, really? That's the first year said, that's like the, or the second? In the first year, I go to talk to him and say, you know, I'm here, I'm interested in policy, uh, I'm going through these classes, uh, any suggestions? And he said, well, why don't you work for me as a research assistant this summer? Hmm. And that was, that was that. You feel like <laughs> you and him hit it off immediately? So it's like, a yeah. how come? What's the, what's it like to hit it off with him? What's the kind I mean, of, he's, he's just devoted to getting the facts right willing to spend his uh you know he spent he spent inordinate amounts of time with his students mm. um he was willing to kind of help people learn and really supportive i found mm. and um you know he willing to hire me to do something that he probably could have done in a day mm. i spent the whole summer doing it but mm -hmm. he knew i would learn something from that and that that was fine so this so, is your first, this is kind of like your, this is kind of like your first moment of data then. Yeah. I mean, I'd done a little bit of data analysis at EPI, but yeah. but yeah, um, at EPI, my big project was, was inverting input output matrices. Mm. Um, but this was, this was, I'm actually getting the micro data and he has me doing, you know, put together a data set of a bunch of stacking a bunch of census data sets mm. um at, at one point i go to him he asks me that he says okay well now that we've done this now we're going to run an instrumental variables regression where we, we i don't remember what was the instrument or what was the regression and i say okay that sounds great but i don't actually know what instrumental variables is mm. and he sits down and sketches it out on a piece of paper and spends half an hour teaching it to me and um then i got it <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I don't know that I have the patience to kind of spend that much time with my research assistants teaching mm. them the basics like that. Mm. Uh, but it was it was great. Mm. So, I mean, are you getting at that time already? Are you starting to kind of feel like you're getting that like local average treatment effect and the and the potential outcomes, or is it like what what kind of things could you tell me that you know you're noticing now? looking back that you're kind of getting from card or from Berkeley. I think in that first year, it was really just an ethic of getting the facts, right. And kind of uh -huh. caring about doing the data, right. It wasn't, I wasn't getting any of the formalisms yet. Yeah. Um, in my second or third year, I forget, I took uh, an applied econometrics class that Ken Che taught ah. that, uh, and that was really where we started to get the, the kind of formal, this is how you do this is how you do causal inference. Um, what do you, what do you spending. think? What, what is the stuff back then that's making an impression on you, particularly when you're getting, when you're taking Ken Chase class? Yeah. I mean, I think again, it's, it's more the, we want to get it right than anything particular about methods. I mm. think a lot, I think Ken spent a lot of time on, on propensity score matching at that point. That was the, hot thing yeah right um right. and uh and so i think but wasn't particularly about the method it was about you know it matters to get it right this isn't just a game mm -hmm. you want to get the answer right mm -hmm. and so i think maybe the other thing i was getting at that period um was this was also the era of lots of papers with really clever instruments that probably yeah. didn't pass any any mm. serious investigation Hmm. And people would talk about them, but with a fair amount of skepticism. So you kind of learn to be to have a little bit of to say, "Hey, look, you know, just because somebody can tell a story doesn't necessarily mean it's right." Hmm. And let's try to figure out how to how to evaluate it. Your your peers are talking that way. Your professors are talking that way. I think my professor, I think that's what you hear in seminars. You know, the clever. We know this is right, kind of thing. The clever instrument 
even though it might be replacing a, okay, so this is, you can tell me if I'll be, I'll, I'll yeah. play a particular character. So you could, I, I spoke with Orly Ashenfelter and he said, I remember the day when people would run instrumental variables and they wouldn't even tell you what the instrument was. That was pretty right. funny, right? And so, so, so you can imagine like, uh, you know, a, the clever instrument stage being synonymous with this improvement, but you're kind of saying a, something a little more subtle. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're saying exactly? Yeah. So I think it was an improvement, you know, better to know, to be told what the instrument was than to not know what it is. Right. And you know, that, that people put a lot of effort into kind of coming up with one where there was a story behind it. Yeah. You could tell, mm -hmm. but it was still a little bit too much in the clever. It was kind of too clever by half. And that was the sense that people had that, that there's lots of stories you could tell. And mm. some of them, you know, they just didn't seem like they passed a, a smell test. Hmm. Um, or, or they might, you know, the story might make sense, but then if you wanted to do it carefully, you'd need to do it a little bit differently and nobody, and people hadn't bothered to do that yet. Hmm. And so hmm. it was, it was just a sense that, you know, how confident should we be that these results are right? I don't know yet. Right. Um, right. So I can give an example of the, from a few years later, but the kind of, to me, captured the flavor of it. The, so there were a number of papers that used rainfall in April 1968 as an instrument for whether there were riots after Martin Luther King was killed. Oh, really? I didn't know that. An idea. The idea. The idea was to try to predict whether a city, what the long-term effect was of riots on oh. kind of urban development. Yeah. And the theory was that if you if it rained that week, the people probably stayed home. Yeah, you can um, see the thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's a clever idea. It's yeah. a, and you know, the rainfall in April, rainfall at any given time is, you know, reasonably random. And so I think that makes sense. The, but the, the, at least some of the papers at that point were just run, just thinking regressing outcomes in 1990 on whether there was a riot in 1968 with rainfall as an instrument okay. and no controls. Well, Rainfall is not randomly assigned across all cities. Right, right. It's much more likely to rain in April in Memphis than it is in Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or right. something like that. Yeah, sure. And so it would have to oh. to do that right to really to really make that a ra as good as random. What you'd want to do is control for what fraction of April's it rains in that city. Mm, mm. And if you do that, then it's probably pretty as good as random whether it rains that particular April. Right, right, right. So it was a it's an idea that could work, but it just hadn't they hadn't really gotten to the point of let's really isolate the randomness yet. Huh. You're talking um, this way, you're thinking you you and your colleagues or uh your classmates are kind of talking that way? This kind of really scrutinizing the design or scrutinizing the instrument. Is it mainly IV that's getting in your head? Um, I think that's probably the most common one at that point. Um, yeah, I think that's, I don't know how much we're coming up with it versus just hearing it a lot. Mm -hmm. But I do remember that, you know, orally visited during that, during one of the years I was in grad school, um, hearing it from David, hearing it from John Donardo, who visited, mm -hmm. hearing it from Hito Imbens, who visited during that period, that I remember hearing a lot of times, okay, so you're, you're doing this analysis. What's the hypothetical experiment that would identify the effect you're interested in? And how does this how does this analysis you're doing approximate that experiment? Um, as a, that's I, different. That's a, that's a question, question I remember hearing from Orly, hearing attributed to Orly as you know. Oh, that's it. A, you're, that not, source you're not getting a causal Orly? effect unless there's unless there's an experiment that goes with it. Yeah. So so that's that's fascinating that that's in. Man, it just seems like everything seems to go back to or Orly Ashenfelder that. I've yeah. Heard. Uh. So so again, I just want to try to understand yeah. this though that to me is directly connected okay so why is that not directly connected with the clever instrument well i think it is but but we hadn't yet gotten to the point i think that lesson that causation is about is only really identified by experiments yeah by randomization 
mm. had not quite fully penetrated oh. into how do you implement it to isolate the randomization. I see. And I so see. Orly was asking the question, but it needed to be asked because a lot right. of people hadn't thought about that question at that point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, right. You know, and clearly the people who came up with the rainfall instrument had that idea in mind, but we just hadn't gotten to the point yet where people realized that it wasn't just it wasn't enough to have the idea in mind. You actually had to isolate the randomness. You had to isolate the randomness. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Well, that do you think that even is being coming from that late theorem? Because, you know, prior to everything being framed in the late theorem, you've just got exogenous instruments. But, you know, the late theorem is is got this explicit, you know, independence assumption inside it, which is distinct from the exclusion restriction. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know that I had really internalized the late theorem yet. I don't know how much that was really, that was around, but it was pretty new at that point. And mm. I don't know how much, well, for one thing, we were always thinking, you know, you weren't ordinarily thinking of heterogeneous treatment effects as a default assumption. It, oh. was, it was perfectly normal to kind of think of, of constant treatment effects. Got it. That period. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, so you, you end up working. Is Card your main advisor? Card ends up being my main advisor. Yeah. What do you end up working on? Uh, so I ended up writing it. Um, so he, the one of the projects he had me work on as a research assistant was he was doing that. He did a paper with Alan Kruger on the effect of ending affirmative action in California on applications to on black and Hispanic applications to the University of California. And as part of that project, uh, he got they got data for uh, on SAT takers, mm -hmm. uh, and so I one of one of the things I did for him was I cleaned that that SAT data. Is um, that your first paper, your Journal of Econometrics? I wasn't. Well, so that grew out of that. I you know I was just a research assistant on the Card and Kruger paper. I wasn't a co-author. Co oh, but at okay. some point, I go to David and I say, you know, look, these SAT data are really interesting. There must be, you know, there are a lot of things, other things you could do with it beyond this question. Uh -huh. And he said, well, you know, why don't you go do one of them? And so, you know, tell me what your best ideas are. Mm. And uh, the Journal of Econometrics paper grew out of that. It, it ended up using different data, but it was, it was using SAT data and uh, looking at admissions to, to the University of California. And then uh, my job market paper was, was using the SAT data. It was a, a, it's called Good Principles or Good Peers. Oh, yeah, that comes out in AER. Okay. Yeah. That was what a is study that paper of school about? choice. So oh, it's that's about basically saying, it's, so it's not about an experiment or anything like that. The, the idea is we have this proposal to do, to let people choose schools. Mm. A lot of the reason, a lot of the argument for it is that is if you create a market in schools, people will choose the better schools and that will create rewards for schools that are, that are good and penalties for schools that are bad and create kind of market incentives for schools to get better. Mm -hmm. And I started, and I was thinking about what, about how that would work and thought, you know, well, a predicate of that whole chain of logic is that when people choose schools, they're going to choose the good ones. Yeah. But do parents know what are the good schools? Do they, can they, can they identify them? It wasn't so clear to me. And so I, I said, well, let's then, think about how you a, could identify. Well, what would that what would parents have had access to back then? It's a good question. That Full was part court, of a, just uh, kind of like a social network or something. You were just starting to get some versions of accountability that would that would you could get average test scores at the school level or something like that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, they weren't consistently available or very widely available. Okay. Um. And I remember one statistic that stuck with me. California had put out its um, first test scores in, around this period where they'd done testing of students, the students and put them out uh, and put out average scores at the school level. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, they'd surveyed parents to try to kind of collect some basic demographics. Mm -hmm. And so they did this survey that had something like a 50% response rate. And based on that survey, they calculated the average education of parents in the school. Mm -hmm. And they, one of the statistics that was buried in the report when you looked at it was that the correlation between the average test score of students at the school and the average parent education was 0.94. Mm. And I said, okay, that's a fascinating fact. That says to me that whatever we're picking up here, 
is this really school quality or is this, or, or are these headquarters some sort of sorting composition? Yeah. yeah. This is the Tebow and, equilibrium. It's the sorting. Exactly. Ah. Well, yeah. So then the, so then, so then I realized that, well, look, there's two explanations for that. One is the test scores are just measuring student family background. Right. And they're just doing it well. And so you got to, so you're not really, it's nothing about the schools at all. It's just which students are at the school. Yeah. But the other possibility is that there are good and bad schools and the parents know about it very well. And the rich and the, the families with high, with more education are making sure their kids go to those schools. Yeah. Yep. And so, so the causation goes from the school quality to the parental education rather than from the parental education to the test scores. Oh, and so wow. my job market paper was an effort to disentangle those. Wow. What did very Card, indirectly. What did Card think about that paper I mean, while you were, while he was watching it emerge? Yeah. So at first I went to him and I said, well, I've got this idea. And he's like, well, hold on to that, but let's keep looking. Uh -huh. We'll come up with a better idea. Um, but then over the next couple of months, I didn't come up with a better idea. And he said, okay, well, you know, let's we'll see what you can do with that one. <laughs> <laughs> was he pretty, was he pretty impressed when at the final thing? I mean, was he, is he, a hard, was he a hard professor to impress? Was that, is that even the right word to think about? Yeah, I, I don't even know that I would have compute. I would have known to think about whether he was impressed or not. Hmm. You know, he certainly gave lots of advice and it was one of the ideas that I absorbed was that there is no perfect paper. Hmm. Um, and that, you know, that it can always be improved and certainly my papers can be improved. Mm -hmm. um, and he helps a lot with it, mm -hmm. but he also, you know, as I've gotten to know him better later, you know, he does, he very clearly kind of matches the advising to what he thinks will benefit the student. Wow. And there are some, and you know, there are students, there are, th there are papers that might be great in one person's hands, but another student isn't really ever going to be able to pull that off. Hmm. And that's okay. You just help the student get get to do as well as they can. What did you? Why do you think you, in particular, uh, really benefit from that style of advising? I don't know. Um, I think at the time I didn't have that much imposter syndrome about it. I mm. was, I was, I knew I could learn, and I knew I had a lot to learn, and I didn't somehow for whatever reason my ego just didn't get caught up in it as much as it does to me in other settings or it does to lots of students and so i could hear the criticism and take it as constructive and not not be bruised by it mm. you're um, you mentioned i don't know what, what about that setting made that work but it worked imposter syndrome that's interesting you bring it up a lot of people would be amazed to think that you would ever feel that but that you're saying that that did start to that at later it's something that you did feel a little bit earlier and later at various times i felt it in various settings but i somehow maybe because i had never really planned to get a phd i, I just wasn't that emotionally invested in it yeah and could and you know if it, if it worked out great if it didn't work out there were other things i could do yeah yeah and yeah. i wasn't I, I, so I, I could somehow take in critique and suggestion without, without feeling bruised by it. Right. 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 So you end up, you end up at, uh, at Princeton. I mean, what was it like? What were, what was your years like there? Uh, I mean, yeah, a it, it, lot of, a lot of really great publications while you're there. How did you, how did the whole process feel? Yeah. I mean, you know, that was the mothership. If you were a David Card student, the, the, the kind of, it was clear that you were being, steeped in this tradition that had had started around the around the counter at the industrial relations section of Princeton. yeah totally totally um and so you know did you have all a sense the... of the history when you got there did you have a sense of the yeah yeah i did i mean hmm. i don't know that i knew all of it but i had actually dave had spent a year on sabbatical there when i was a grad student and i sent i, I spent a semester as a grad student there oh. and kind of got a sense of it um and so i knew the people a little bit when i got hired back there so what? Orly's um, there. Kruger's there. Is David Orly, Lee there? Kruger. Uh, no, David Lee is at Berkeley. He gets hired at Berkeley by the, towards the end of my time in grad school. Okay. Um, the uh, C.C. Rouse is there. Hank Farber. Wow. Jeff Kling. Um, and then, uh, you know, my first year there as an assistant professor, Alex Moss is on the job market. Mm. So um, he's around. Um. So y'all become close. Place. 
you and Moss become close? I know y'all have written yeah. a few times together. He yeah. was he so y'all overlapped a little bit. He and I keep switching places. Uh but <laughs> we're now finally in the same place. It's great. Uh but um so he he we overlapped with his last year of grad school, my first year as a professor. Then he gets a job at Berkeley yeah. and comes out here. Yeah. Um then uh you know, around in, in 2009, he, we both take jobs in the Obama administration. He's in the Department of Labor and I'm at the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, then at some point he gets hired away from the Department of Labor to OMB and I get hired into his, his job at, at, at the OL. Uh, and then when we leave Washington, he goes to Princeton and I go to Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but so you made promise him, you're like, if you come here to Berkeley, I promise I'll probably stay here this time. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just the way it's worked out, right? Um, right. Well, so, so this paper, uh, tipping in the dynamics of segregation with yeah. Card and Moss, that's a that's a very very cool paper. Can you tell me where this paper came from? Sure. And what's so the Dave, like, for the sake of the listener who doesn't know what yeah. it is? Also, you can say it. Also, what your the the origin and what it's about. Sure. So. Dave and I had been working on residential segregation and school segregation, and we have this paper on segregation and test score gaps, mm -hmm. they, um, which in we in modern terms, I guess, maybe you could think of it as we're seeing, we're basically using city segregation as a measure, as a instrument for exposure to students of a different race, mm. um, is roughly what, what the, the setup is. Mm. Um, but we, so we're, we've obviously been thinking a lot about, about, Kind of neighborhood composition and how how that varies across places. We've done a lot of building of segregation measures, and at some point we have a conversation, and he calls me up and he says, "You know, look, I just had this. I've been talking with Alex, and he just showed me this this fantastic graph, and we should do something with it." And the graph was they took neighborhoods in Chicago over a ten year period, and they plotted the kind of fraction black in the neighborhood in the base year on the x-axis and the change in the, the fraction black over the next 10 years in the y-axis. Mm. And you can see in that graph, it's just a scatter plot, but you can see a clear discontinuity. Mm. And that, you know, we, we, we don't really have a great story for it, but that's basically the origin for the paper. It's noticing that in a lot of places, you see this, that, that there's a discontinuous relationship between the racial composition of a neighborhood and what happens thereafter. Mm, what was the outcome? And what was the outcome around the discontinuity? So the change in the white population over the next ten years. Say. Oh, got it. Segregation is, is you're watching, and and what's the cutoff? It's the the threat. The so running variable is what exactly? The fraction black in the in the neighborhood in the base year. Oh, and then there's a tip. The fraction. Yeah, exactly. And so this discontinuity is is tipping that it seems like oh. as long as the black share doesn't get above a certain point, then you get kind of growth in the white population. But mm -hmm. if the black share gets above that point, you get fairly catastrophic declines in the in the white population. You find this this point to be the same in a lot of areas, or is it varying a lot? As we well, we now start to dig into it and we find that it does vary some across places, but that it does look like each city has a pretty clearly defined point. What is it? Like and what's we, an example? So sometimes it's like eight percent, sometimes it's like twelve percent. Uh huh. and part of the paper is doing an analysis of where it's higher and where it's lower. Yeah. Um, and we connect it to the there's, you know, there's a lot of sociological discussion about white flight, about tipping points. Uh, uh, Schelling's old model of tipping points was yeah. a was a model of neighborhood segregation, mm -hmm. and a lot of these papers, a lot of these stories have this idea that there is some threshold, and if it gets beyond the threshold, the kind of white families get uncomfortable. Mm. And it looked like we had empirical evidence for that. So, um, what are you going to look at? The outcome you're looking at the you're looking at segregation coming from the tipping. Yeah, we're, we're looking at changes in neighborhood composition. I think of segregation as an aggregate statistic. Yeah. But we're looking at, at this neighborhood. If this neighborhood goes, goes above the threshold, what happens to it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I think it's something that, you know, we now talk a lot about pre-specified research designs. Yeah. Nobody would have pre-specified this design because even if you believe the Shelley model, 
there wasn't it wasn't obvious that the point would be common across lots of different neighborhoods yeah yeah and if yep. the point varies a lot heterogeneously mm -hmm. then it's gonna be very hard to see the kind of patterns we see and yeah, so yeah we yeah. have said let's go look for these patterns but we saw these patterns and mm. they were pretty interesting and pretty consistent hmm. and so we we worked on um trying to basically do, to document that they were there yeah did you That's face a lot of opposition in getting that paper published or getting people to feel persuaded by it? I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, it's it's in a lot, it's basically a descriptive paper. It's just showing that these that this pattern exists. We're not making causal claims about it, really. It's just, you know, not making a, a model that generates this. Even though it's kind of got this think, RD flavor to it? It's kind of got this RD flavor to it, but but we didn't, this wasn't something where we had a program and we were looking at whether yeah. you, which side of the discontinuity you're on. We were saying, Hey, look, the data show a discontinuity, mm. and we're not. And that was that was the that was basically it for the paper, showing the data showed a discontinuity. Mm. Um, so I think of it as more descriptive than than really a kind of causal analysis. You could interpret it as saying, "Look, it does look like it, there's some causal effect of going across this threshold." Mm. Uh, and we kind of a lot of the methods we used were basically trying to show that that they would work. You know, the, the kind of standard causal techniques would work for this they would but i yeah yeah so like one of the worries you have is that well if you're looking if you get to if you're looking for where the threshold is as a place where things change then it might be too easy to find a threshold because things you know just random variation will make it look like there's a there's a chain a change point somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. and so we drew on there's a there's a literature in time series on change points mm. and on, on identifying change points and we drew on that to kind of as a way of kind of trying to reason about what the what the kind of false discovery problem would be in this. Oh study. wow! Um, we ended up doing a split sample. Uh, you can think of it as split sample IV uh -huh. uh, to do it, where we estimate the the change point on one on one sample, and then use the other sample to test it to try to avoid oh. again finding spurious relationships. Oh wow! Huh. Um, so it was a fun paper. It was um, a fun paper. It, yeah, but it's definitely not. Um, I you know it was not a conventional program evaluation, and I think mm -hmm. a lot of the challenges we had with that were in trying to figure out what are the right tools to use in this for this. How do we even kind of frame this as a paper, given given that that it wasn't well. So the question wasn't quite as clearly defined as it might be. Fifteen years later, you've had all this time to think about it. What do you think this paper's lasting value is then what do you think you've learned from it or that that you know you think there really was something i get i personally ch was changed and learned this from it yeah i mean so i you know again i think that we really did have real evidence that there was something important about about segregation about composition affected people's willingness to live in a neighborhood and i do think mm -hmm. it's still pretty strong evidence of that mm -hmm. um you know, I think it, it uh, so, so I think it's valuable on the substance. I think there was also, you know, methodological uh, things that I took away from it. I think we were one of the first papers to try to do, to try to do what amounted to regression discontinuity in a setting where we had to estimate where the discontinuity was from the data. Yep. 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 And I think we, we developed some tools. And for that's that. where you're doing this kind of time series thing to rule out these false, false discontinuities. Well, both the time series and the split sample thing. And the split um, sample thing. Yeah. Actually, there, there's a story about that, um, that we, you know, we knew we had this problem that we had, there was this possibility that you could find a discontinuity, even if there wasn't one, just because if you're, if you have to, if you search all the, over all the points, it's like a, it's like a false discovery problem. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's somebody, I forget who, but somebody suggested we go look at Bruce Hansen's papers on this. Mm. Um, and so we go look at a bunch of papers and there's one that's called like sample splitting as a solution to the kind of, I don't know, to some problem. I don't even remember the name of the title. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I see that title and I think, oh, that's great. That's perfect. Why don't we just do that? We, we, um, we could divide the tracts into two halves and use one half to identify the, where the tipping point is. And then the other one to test whether there's actually a discontinuity there. And Later on, I'm on this call with David, and he's like, "Yeah, well, that's not what that means about at all." 
it's not it's really about trying to split a time series into a pre and a post period it's a totally different exercise but it's not a bad idea and so that's a very like modern approach i mean that's kind of this uh isn't that sort of like the stuff you see in the calls of forest and the double d bias machine learning these sort of splitting these things up like that but you were doing yeah. it you almost found it by you were doing it by accident yeah i mean you know we weren't the first to come up with that idea. Sure. i think it showed up in some of the two sample iv papers mm. that kruger and others were doing in that period mm. but um but yeah i think it was a it was relatively new at that point mm. Mm. Well, I, I'm curious about this lab, the California yeah. policy lab. What is the, yeah. what is this lab? Yeah. So, uh, it's an effort to pair research expertise from the university of California with state and local public agencies in California who have data and have research, important research questions that are important to kind of doing to, to policy, but who don't have the research expertise to kind of do the, do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, it's whose idea was this? The, so it's it's hard to know exactly where they, you know, ideas don't. Nobody wrote it down first, and then everybody else went from there. Uh, so it's some kind of joint development of me, Till von Vachter, our two executive directors, Evan White and Janie Roundtree, and a uh, program officer at the Arnold Foundation. Uh, mm. all, some combination of us in various conversations over the first few months kind of figured out what it would be. Mm. Arnold was then funding a bunch of policy labs, which were, which was an effort to do this, to try to kind of create the opportunity to do quick turnaround to program evaluation work for government to try to help improve policy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we saw an opportunity in California where, where California was miles behind the rest of the country in terms of making use of its administrative data. Mm. Uh, but we saw that, you know, in the wake of the, you know, the tech boom here, there was more interest in in data driven policy and more mm. interest in making use of the data. It was also there were also technological changes that made it possible that uh, it was no longer. It used to be that government agencies would each have their data in a kind of custom database that was a different format from every other every other agency's database, and there was no way to get the data out. Mm -hmm. And we realized that by this point, it was, you now could get the data out and it was relatively easy to kind of to pull, extract data and link it across agencies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so it was an opportunity to to build this capacity for the state. Mm -hmm. And then I guess I'd say a, another piece of the origin story is a perception that it was increasingly the case that the way you were successful as a PhD student was not by having a good idea but by finding somebody who would give you data that nobody else had. Mm. And that didn't seem good for the profession at all or good for research. It, mm. it meant that, you know, we were rewarding connections, not, not ideas. Right. And right. Um, so part of it was an effort to try to cre create data as a public good, mm. a, a, a way for, to, to build data resources that students could, could use without having to have had those connections themselves. Yeah, and it would benefit the benefit the state. Hmm. How has it been? What has it felt like being a part of this thing? It's been exciting. Uh, I think you know we were right that there was openness to doing this kind of work in California. That there was a need at the re at the agency level to have some research support. Yeah, and that the the technological barriers weren't going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, we were right that there was demand from the academic side. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, it's still harder than it ideally would be to develop data use agreements and to kind of get data linked mm -hmm. and to, um, and, you know, I've increasingly realized just how many different agencies data is split among and how mm -hmm. many you'd need to kind of work with to be able to build the data set you'd want for a project you want. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been building towards it. And I think we've done some, some interesting work along the way. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I was going to talk to you about augmented synthetic control, but I've been here. I've been talking to your ear off for, for an hour and I, I wanted to, to, to just kind of conclude. Um, okay. So uh, if you could go back in time and maybe mm -hmm. talk to that student who's getting nauseous in their own exposure to their own EC10, mm -hmm. uh, 
and you know you sort of could pull them aside you know what do you think that they what do you what do you think you would tell that that kid back then you know that that from your heart what would you tell that kid uh, i mean i think one thing that i would tell them that i think is still true is that economics is a lot more interesting than econ 101 mm. i think we make i think we take all the interesting things about it out to try to make it seem like a simple story yeah and um i think that's a shame mm -hmm. and um so I, I still think we need to work on econ 101 and trying to make that better better reflect the real world and the what what economics really is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but um so that's one thing but i you know for me it worked really well to not be so worried about coming up with a path ahead of time mm. and i i think it's fewer fewer students seem to be willing to do that these days or mm. and i think the world's made it a little bit harder to do that um you know i don't know that i could have gotten into a phd program these days without having spent several years building up the resume for it sure um, sure and that's that's a shame yeah um, yeah yeah that's great well yeah. uh it's been really nice i yeah it's uh, nice talking to you I hope that our paths cross in person and then uh, get to get to say, hey. Yeah, I'm sorry I talked so much. We didn't get to synthetic control. <laughs> yeah. <no. laughs> well, I, I, I teach it now all the time and I've really, really Great. loved it. Um, I really, it's Great. packed full, that augmented synth paper is packed full of really interesting stuff, especially the old um, bias adjustment from Abity and Embens. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. That's that's my favorite way of thinking about it. There are lots of ways of thinking about it, but I think of it as it's it's adjusted for observables. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, it just it comes full circle. Uh and I'm getting better at teaching it, but um uh I'm curious. I mean, have you had a lot of positive responses to it? Do people it's got a lot of citations? Yeah, it's got citations. People seem to be finding it useful. Um, yeah, you know, it's amazing how much demand there is for a method that works in this setting. Right. And so I think, you know, I, I'm still worried that a lot of the settings where we're using it are not settings where we really have a plausible case that we're going to identify causal effects. Yeah, 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 um, sure. They're not very promising settings, but they're settings where we really want to estimate something. Yeah. And I wonder rather... if I've been I wonder if I've been teaching it wrong a little bit because I think I started out really drilling on this negative weighting and not be like, you know, kind of like the the least negative. But the more I've mm -hmm. really linked it back to that Abity and Imbens uh 2011 paper, it just, it just, you know, if then it just starts fitting with this overall imperfect fit so much yeah. better. I mean, you know, you, you can see the negative weighting, but if you if you lead with the negative weighting and you don't really think in terms of this like estimating of this put of this you know potential outcome bias or the the or estimating this you know estimating this bias using i mean it's estimating the bias using the control group in the post treatment mm -hmm. period right so it's you know so it's it's just like it it's just it it's is just like it it is and you and you know the connection is you only get that bias because you're not willing to accept negative weights in exactly, exactly negative weight otherwise I mean, if you yeah. if you accept a negative weight to, to begin with then you then you get perfect balance on the observables yeah 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 you know i am mean, kind of curious a little bit i mean it does it does feel like when i've spoken with alberto you know um i don't really understand very well in my own words why it ever was the case that we needed that convex hull. So it's like, I, I, what I don't really fully understand is like, is it coming from, do you think it's coming from something, some sort of important principle? Because I mean, even in your, even in your method, it's, it's funny, like it's not as negative as it could be. Right. So there's like, what exactly, it could be as OLS basically. Yeah, exactly. You could always get it. Like you could always get the fit better. So like, yeah. You're, you're, there must be, what is going on with this? Like, cause it's not the same negative weighting you're hearing about with diff and diff. It's this negative weighting of the donor pool unit. And I'm just kind of yeah. curious, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. 
so I guess the way the analogy I would draw is we still find kind of matching style estimators yeah. attractive. Mm -hmm. Even when you have propensity scores and you can do propensity score weighting, there's something attractive about the intuition about being able to match and say, yep. look, we have a treated observation and here's its here's its statistical twin. Mm -hmm. those two. Mm -hmm. And but matching is we're only going to allow you know weights that add up to one and are all positive. Right. Mm -hmm. And in matching, you typically would be equal weights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's something attractive about that, mm -hmm. um, about not just throwing it into X prime X inverse X prime Y and letting that go with it. Letting that. What run. do you think is the attractive part? The fact that we're using comparable units that that something like that, or what is it exactly? Well, it's, negative weight I mean, kind of could take you know the whole thing with negative weight is it's like it's kind of maybe taking you a little bit far away from your from your treated unit. A yeah. Little. Yeah. So I think I think the the when you boil down the the math behind that intuition, I think it's that extrapolation is dangerous. Yeah, right. And that if, anytime you're doing negative weights, you're basically trying to use the relationship within the control observations mm -hmm. to extrapolate outside them, mm -hmm. outside of that convex hull. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And there's, you know, if you saw a regression where there were, you were controlling for X, but the distribution of X in the treated group and the control group are wildly different from each other. Mm -hmm. You'd be pretty worried about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Worry that we can't really successfully control for X. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think that's that's the issue that comes up here. Hmm. A lot of you know, it's funny. A lot of this stuff shows up. It just keeps showing up. I mean, uh, you know, the matching, uh, needing common support, synthetic control yeah. needing this balance, regression, uh, you know, under unconfoundness using functional form to estimate counterfactuals and. Here, you know, you're kind of, it's kind of, well, you're using an outcome regression, you're using an outcome model to get those, to estimate that bias, right? So you're, you are doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think of it as, you know, I'm 25 years into my career and I'm still learning yeah. more things about OLS. I know. And we're, we're still understanding OLS better. And all of yeah. these are just different ways of understanding what OLS does and doesn't do. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, so yes, we are having to extrapolate, and we're do, we are doing some of that. But I think we we see this as this is the minimum extrapolation you need to do. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's it's really beautiful. Um, I love teaching nice. it. I, I love because nice. it's like it just sort of seem you know the way I teach it just kind of seamlessly fits, and it helps you kind of immediately, and you kind of realize, um, you're probably going to need to be open minded to this, uh, because otherwise certain questions will never be answered. Exactly. You know, exactly. okay. Well, Jesse, so much fun to, to talk. Yeah, uh, love, really nice loved it. Okay, yeah. all right, I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot. See Take care.